ஆகியோர் வணக்கம் ஸோ திஸ் இஸ் மை ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் விசிட் டு கொல்கத்தா அண்ட் யூனோ ஐ இஃப் யூ ஹவ் சீன் மீ ஸ்பீக் ஃப்ரம் மை ஹோம் பி அ ப்ராமினெண்ட் சுவாமி விவேகானந்தா ஸ்டாச்சு பிஹைண்ட் மீ அண்ட் ஐ எம் அ பிஸ்னஸ் மேன் ஐ எம் ட்ரூலி இன்ஸ்பயர்ட் பை from vivekananda's life mission and his work in fact every day one of my uh, friends he sends me a swami vivekananda quote by email every single day and i begin my day with it he religiously sends it and occasionally i tweet about it but every day i actually do read that quote and swami vivekananda's work i mean it started here and i'm also very happy to say there is a big swami vivekananda kendra in kanyakumari which is where a lot of his work began to right he started here with uh, bhagwan ramakrishna paramamsa and then he went to kanyakumari where he found a spiritual inspiration to be the the swami of our nation modern nation the, he combined every virtue of this nation from the spiritual heritage to our today what we are emerging as a technology nation and he connected all this together that's important and that is what i am you know so i am very happy to be giving this particular presentation here holistic model of development because this is what really swami vivekananda embodied and this is his place so first i'll just give you a brief uh, we are about 12000 employees now we already grew largest indian saas company and uh, my the company i won't talk about much but it really the thesis for me is rural economic revival with technological self reliance and rejuvenation of our civilization all of this rejuvenation of our great nation and it's a nation not just as a political entity but a civilizational and a spiritual scientific technological all of it go together and that is the really the theme here and this is something that i deeply feel as a as a profound uh, thing and uh, it is also particularly now relevant our president uh, Mr. Mitra talked about the whole social audit and then the profit, people and planet together. So more than ever before, the world is realizing that all of these have to be viewed holistically. We cannot just view profit, technology, all that separate from the people involved and the whole planet. And this is the key thing that drives our company. any strategy business strategy or technology it has to be rooted it has to be rooted and you in fact the hardest part to see here is always technology connected to our roots and that's where i actually spend a lot of time connecting technology to our roots and the reason why our company is successful we have emerged as a global player is because we have successfully connected technology the way we invent technology and the way we uh, market that around the world and the way we use it ourselves all of it is actually rooted all of it is connected to the way we are both uh, uh, our our origin from within our nation the majority of our employees and the soul of this nation operating through our company and this is critical that that self confidence that we as a nation must feel more self confident and that also has to be rooted in humility that we cannot we cannot be self confident as a nation that is arrogant and we cannot be if we are true to our roots we cannot be arrogant so humility is a foundation of our confidence this seems you know 
for a, a dualistic mind, these things will seem like contradiction. And uh, prosperity must be rooted in contentment. Again, for a dualistic pattern, and if you ask a conventional economist, contentment is the opposite of economic progress. Economic growth, they will say. If everybody is contented, how are we going to achieve growth? And yet, the planet's future depends on figuring this out. How are we going to be prosperous as a nation, as a world? How are we going to deliver rural prosperity that is rooted in contentment? So this is, uh, I taught my story, I actually moved to a, a small village, that's where I came from directly yesterday. Morning I started at 4 a.m., about four hour journey to Madurai, from Madurai to Chennai, from Chennai to Kolkata. So, and by the time I reached here, it was about 9, 9, 10 p.m. My journey started at 4 a.m. in the village at home. And the district itself is Tenkasi, and it reflects the, the unity of our nation, Dakshin Kashi. You can actually uh, find this on the internet, just Google this, you'll find uh, beautiful photos of our uh, big temple there, Vishwanath Mandir. And there's a big waterfall, you'll see both in a lot of photos. These are the two famous landmarks in the town. The town itself is about 75,000 people. The surrounding rural district is about 13 lakh people, about 1.3 million, which I often say is the same as the country of Estonia, which is a technologically advanced European nation, which came out of the whole Soviet empire's collapse. Now it's a very confident nation, about 1.3 million people, same as that district, my district. And I often say, can we take one district to be like Estonia? That is how I pose that question. What does it take for this 1.3 million people to achieve the, the same level of prosperity as in Estonia? In fact, that's why I made it my home. I live in, I don't live in the town. I live in a village about 35 kilometers from the town. It's a fairly big district and uh, it's a very remote region. To get to the nearest airport is about 90 kilometers from and there are not very many flights there, so I have to go to Madurai, which is about 150 kilometers. So, and it is the, the grandest experiment I have started in my life. That uh, three years ago I moved, about three and a half now. And uh, so as in a scientific sense, I wanted to prove to myself or disprove to myself, one of the two. You know, you always, when you start as a scientist, you have to be aware that you may end up proving something or disproving something. That your assumptions are false, your hypothesis is false. You have to be ready for that. So that's why I made certain hypotheses. And I will tell you about this. And this is the underlying assumption about mainstream economics today, that all of prosperity comes from urbanization. That we cannot prosper as a rural district, as a rural area. Essentially, all of the assumption of is, is this. In fact, I go to colleges, and Tamil Nadu has a lot of engineering colleges in the last 30 years. Most of those colleges are in deeply rural areas, but the mission of all those colleges is to educate the youngsters who will then leave. So I, in fact, I said it in a college uh, function. I said the purpose of this college has become an efficient vacuum cleaner of talent. Suck the talent. Deliver it elsewhere, deliver it to Chennai, deliver it to Bangalore, deliver it to Silicon Valley, deliver it to Singapore, but not deliver it to ourselves here. The district will remain the same, it will be trapped in poverty, all of that, but because urbanization, migrating to urban areas is the only path to prosperity. That's an underlying assumption in all of us. And that is not explicitly stated, but modernity conveys urbanity. The word modernity means now urbanity. And we implicitly assume all of that. So now you can see why I began this experiment. I said, well, I want to challenge this. I'm going to not assume this. I've had to prove to myself, is this true or false? I contend that it's not true. And then how do we prove it? Well, somebody has to go there and sit there and do these, do these projects. That's why I moved myself there. And so, this is the assumption. These are unstated assumptions. Rural areas are hopelessly backward. Rural people have to be rescued, urbanized. 
And one country did this grand experiment. China. In the last 30, 40 years, post Deng Xiaoping's reforms, which started in 78, their policy goal was to urbanize. They, in fact, in true Communist Party style, they made that a goal, explicit policy goal. They demolished rural households. They made them into huge farms and moved the population to cities. They brought up new cities out of thin air, huge cities. They moved the farmers into skyscrapers. So you'd be a farmer in a village. Suddenly, you'll find yourself in the 35th floor of a, an urban high-rise building. This experiment they did on a very large scale, scale of hundreds of millions of people. Maybe 600, 700 million people were moved like this. And today, actually about two years ago, they made a very important announcement that they are going to reverse this. They don't want, they, didn't, they don't think this works. They are very worried that you know, ch Chinese civilization will end if they persisted in this experiment. It's very interesting, they came to the conclusion. So they no longer are actually going to encourage this level, kind of urbanizations they pursued as a policy for the last 30, 40 years. Part of it is demographic. Well, birth rates have plummeted so much now that China is in dire, dire economic, you know, demographic straits. Now, in fact, the next 30, 40 years, they will, have a, they will run out of workers in a very big way. And they may have to import workers from India, actually. It is heading there. China is heading there. So they are trying to reverse course. So this is the question. Is the decline of rural areas inevitable? Are there no other courses possible at all? And, and this is why I believe that we have to reverse. Because I also have seen, I lived in Silicon Valley for about 30 years. What is large cities also breed consumption, competitive consumption, they call it. We have to consume because other people consume. And making contentment much harder to achieve. I said prosperity has to be rooted in contentment. Well, if we are constantly comparing ourselves to the next person, what car they own, what is the, do I have the latest iPhone because they have it, well, we are never going to have contentment. And so this is one important reason. And this is particularly now urgent because of climate change. That the, the, the very standard question I'll ask economists is, can the entire world, can all 1.4 billion of us live exactly like a modern American today? Can everybody have a two-car garage? Can everybody drive an SUV? Can everybody consume gasoline, diesel at the same rate Americans consume? Is that possible? Can we build enough roads? Do we have enough gasoline? Can we consume that much energy? These questions are unanswered. Economists don't even think about it. It's an unstated assumption. Somehow we'll figure this out. So this is why I said prosperity must be rooted in contentment. We have to rethink the word prosperity. What does it mean? How do we achieve it? What does it? What does contentment mean? All of this. This is why I started with Swami Vivekananda. I actually would say our economic thinking, our technology thinking, all of it, our prosperity, we have to think in a new light now. That this is an urgent priority for the planet. And so this is another important point. I live in a village now, about 140 kilometers from our nearest big city, Madurai, 60 kilometers from Tirunel Valley, which does not have an airport. And I'm surrounded by nature. I'm surrounded by wild animals, snakes, king cobras. Every, every other day I see a snake around. And it builds a different mindset in you. I tell you this, I, I kind of understand why our Rishis, our sages, sought forests and mountains, all of that. It completely changes your view of life, actually. And that, I believe, is important for us, important for our whole well-being. And solitude. This is another key thing. On a given day, I spend maybe three, four hours completely alone, surrounded only by nature. This, again, does something deep to you. And I, and I also tell you, in the last month, I have filed two critical patents on some very critical aspects of software technology. This was important to me. That if I didn't have this solitude, I won't be inventing all that. I found ways to 
connected to the software I work, but the solitude was essential. So all of these seem like romantic ideas, but I mentioned that I'm filing patents. In the last six months, maybe we have filed about seven patents, and our company is now actually accelerating our technology evolution. We are also accelerating our rural transformation as a company. Both are happening simultaneously. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Just about a month, three weeks ago, we achieved a critical breakthrough in one of our technologies where we, we demonstrated some technology. It's only internal. We have not made any announcements. We'll probably, the products will come out in a year or two, two years maybe. But what was very interesting is the most critical of that work was done by a 20-year-old who came from our Zoho schools of learning, who came from a surrounding village. He studied in a Tamil medium school till his 12th standard. He was identified, taken by our Zoho schools faculty. After one year of training, he has been working in my team. It was an accident. That is, he got placed in my team. I didn't know him before. And he made actually a very important contribution to this breakthrough. 20 year old. This is talent in a remote village, in a remote corner of India, which would never have been found if we didn't happen to have an office there. Now think about how many millions, tens of millions of our talent is there in all these places. And this is, this is why we are there. And I, I tell you, this happened and there is many, many more such stories in Zoho. Hundreds of such stories. Which is why this, I, I mean, I'm, I'm moving there not only as a, you know, all these romantic ideas, but I'm also moving there because there's so much talent that is going simply waste, not used at all. Nobody identifies them. Closer to the laptop, I guess. So this is, I'll just briefly highlight the fundamental economic problem. If you go back 100 years, 200 years, our history, our Indian village had a self-reliant local and regional economy. I have studied this matter quite a bit. I've understood, I've traveled around a lot of villages. These were the ecosystem. We had not only farmers. Rural areas did not mean only farming. Oil makers, weavers, potters, masons, all of the Zion smiths, goldsmiths, vaidyas, musicians, priests. Astrologers. There's a whole ecosystem. And accountants. There's a Tamil word for accountant. The village accountant. And the descendants of those rural craftsmen have become landless labor today. Or migrants, urban migrants. So most of the landless actually come from those professions. Because those professions did not typically own land because they were not farmers. But their descendants have become migrant labor now or landless labor in villages. So the problem is, we do have motorcycles, smartphones, refrigerators, medicines, all that we consume. We consume these in villages. Today, a lot of the transport is motorcycle. And every rural home also now increasingly have refrigerators. And smartphones, of course, 1.1 billion smartphones. Most of them are rural. And yet, how are they paid for? They paid for by of course, agricultural products, that's the only export out of these villages, if you think about it. And the rest is selling their land. So this is why land gets consolidated, because the farmers have to sell. Migrant labor in cities in India or abroad, and you can see them in Bangalore, in Chennai, in Madurai, in, in uh, Mumbai, everywhere you can see this migrant labor. Of course, in, I'm sure in Kolkata as well. And getting into debt, today, Practically every villager has some kind of EMI payment. Practically everyone. And government welfare programs, the Manrega scheme, which is very critical for so many villages everywhere in India. Every morning you will see a cluster of villagers going for this Manrega scheme, which is the only way a lot of them make ends meet today. So this is the key part. The value of agricultural production is insufficient to pay for manufactured goods and advanced services. So your manufactured goods embody technologies that are not accessible to the villager. And the advanced services, I mean, you go to a, just now I found out one of my former farm workers, his wife had a surgery, 76,000 rupees. That would be some months of his income. So, and, uh, and you know, rural citizens have those advanced services. They have to have surgery. But they don't have the income to pay because they are not part of the value chain generating those goods and services. So basically, we cannot treat rural citizens only as consumers. 
they have to become producer. They have to become producer of all these manufactured goods and services. So rural revival is about creating balance. The first word, the balance, and balance is an accounting word. All of you know about balancing the books, but this is the balance of production, balance of consumption, balance between production and consumption. So we have to take part, our rural citizens have to take part in the production of advanced goods and services that they themselves consume. So this is why I have come up with a model, district driven model, clusters of manufacturing capability, particularly focused on the production of household goods. This is something that we are working on right now. We, have, uh, we are setting up some uh, workshops, we are setting up some small factories, and I'll, I'll briefly go through this because I don't want to take too much time in this. This is a long presentation, but I'll cut it short. This is actually, the strategy is very sound. South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Japan, and later even China. China under Deng started with something called town and village enterprises. These were small businesses, small factories in rural areas. That is how they got started in their reforms in 1978. For the first 15 to 20 years, China was driven by that model. And they prospered. Later on, the model changed, very urban driven, but this was the beginning. And this book, How Asia Works, I want to give you a brief thing. This book actually has a very good uh, explanation of the comparative development models of East Asian nations versus nations like Philippines, why the former developed, why the latter didn't develop. The book doesn't talk about India at all, but it's very good lessons for us. And Germany and Switzerland actually have advanced manufacturing industry in rural areas. A lot of the factory machines we import in India come from Switzerland or Germany. They come from very rural areas. And I don't know how many of you know this, the world's leading robot maker, Fanuk, it's a Japanese company. Fanuk is based in rural Japan. There, all their R&D center, everything is in rural Japan. It's about 250 kilometers uh, south of Tokyo. And similarly, you go to Switzerland, there is a company in Switzerland. This company makes machines that are there in every automotive factory in the world. Your car has parts made by that machine. This company is in a Swiss town of 20,000 people, surrounded by countryside. And my nearest town is about 20,000 people, eight kilometers. I often ask, why does a Swiss town of 20,000 people have that factory that produces advanced machines that's there in almost every auto factory in the world? Why cannot an Indian town have that? These are the kinds of questions we have to ask. And a whole variety of household goods can be made in this district level clusters by small to mid-sized companies. Switzerland demonstrates it, Germany demonstrates it, a lot of East Asian uh, companies of this kind exist. And so this is the thing, rural youth near their hometowns. So we are taking the, the descendants of those craftsmen whose crafts are now degraded and make them into these entrepreneurs, factory workers in the very regions they are rooted in. So this is important, the roots are important, in the very region they are rooted in because this is the way to protect our civilization, this is the way also to avoid that competition driven consumption we get into. And how do we enable this household protection? I actually have thought through this, capital goods are important. Today, 80% of our capital goods are important. We are very weak in capital goods, this is an R&D problem, this can be tackled. We are, one thing Zoho is known for. We have hundreds of R&D teams, hundreds, literally hundreds. We are filing huge number of patents. We know R&D extremely well. This presentation was made in a Zoho, tool, Zoho product. And we are now expanding our R&D reach into hardware. For example, we are uh, shipping medical instruments. In fact, I came to Kolkata for another reason. I'm meeting a doctor here, uh, a hematologist. We have invented a thalassemia pump. And you know in, uh, uh, in this region, thalassemia is a major issue. So we actually have a pump we invented. We will cut the cost of that pump, imported pump, by 50, 60% easily for the hospitals here. That's something that our R&D produced. So this is, these are all the kind of capital goods we need to be inventing. We have the brain power to invent, but we have to, to do this, our industry has to do this. In fact, there's only one advice, and recently the budget, uh, deliberations came up, 
No, as a businessman, I get asked, what, do you have some ideas? I said, just like we have a CSR mandate, we should have an R&D mandate on our industry. Industry should be investing in R&D heavily. And uh, Mr. Agarwal is here, and Patram, he's a, a IP, you know, he's both a CA and an intellectual property expert. He talked last night about the importance of R&D. I so passionately agree with him. We should encourage R&D investment. India has one of the lowest R&D investments in the world as a percentage of GDP. Advanced nations invest much more heavily in R&D. Our industry should invest in it. As chartered accountants, you have a responsibility to ensure that our industry invests in it. And this is the reason. You take ordinary household goods, you go buy a nail clipper in the local shop, you will see made in China, made in Korea, occasionally made in Japan, you will not see made in India. Nail clipper, a humble nail clipper. That's because the industrial capability involved is non-trivial. The metal, the metal in it, the steel is non-trivial. The, the machines are non-trivial. Non-trivial means that it's not like you can solve it in like two days. This requires some thought, a degree of invention there, a degree of capability there. So we have to catch up with this two-fold strategy that strongly encourage and incentivize production of household goods relying on tariff and land tariff barriers in India. That means we have to say things like nail clippers, we can make it, our rural citizens need the jobs. So at first, encourage the household goods production. This is a strategy South Korea and China, all of them are adopted first. Then for this, we need capital goods, but we need a five, 10 year plan to indigenous and leapfrog. This is a technology R&D initiative to, to make the machines that make those nail clippers is R&D, and to make them efficient, to make them uh, energy efficient, labor efficient, quality, high, high, they, they are able to produce high quality nail clippers, those require technology. And this is where I, I this is the two-fold process that I've been advocating. We are investing heavily in these, we are investing in these to uh, indigenous lot of the machines. We are studying, we have a group now for manufacturing R&D. This is something that I will strongly encourage our industry to adopt. This is something that I hope that you will pick up from here and talk to your clients, talk to businesses, because R&D is the key to prosperity. And I'll just finish, I'll, I'm, I'm done with this because I don't want to belabor you further, but I'll tell you the benefit of R&D, just one important thing here. If you look at R&D driven businesses, the value addition per employee, that's a very good way to measure it, the value added, could be revenue, but it's really gross, gross profit per employee or gross margin per employee. The value added per employee can be five times to 10 times higher. Roe actually has one of the highest such value added among any Indian company. Our value addition, rate of value addition per employee is two or three times that of other IT services companies. The IT services companies will be adding value at a rate of about 40 to 50 thousand dollars per capita, per person per year value added. We are at 100,000 and beyond. We think we can actually double this in the next five years. We can do $200,000 per person of value addition. And a lot of those jobs will be in rural areas. Those incomes will go into rural pockets. They will spur a regional economy. So it's very possible to do this. We are actually already doing with a very, very you know, in indigenous model, we are achieving global productivity levels right now in our value addition. And this is possible, but the critical thing is to invest in R&D. So this is what, this is my last thing I will end here. Thank you very much, and I'll be open for some Q&A. Thank you. Namaskar.